create a partnership between Brick Township, uh, the community schools, uh, to allow us to use this facility, which is a great place to educate people. Uh, our children learn here. And uh, uh, one of the house members sponsored this trip out of, out of uh, Louisiana is Ducky Johnson out of the Gulf. Uh, there's two or three others that will probably be pitching in and, and on my subsequent trips. So the industry is paying for this to happen, which is really critical because You've got a lot of experience with new construction at the beach having to be an elevation, but New Jersey has very, very little compared to the Gulf experience with retrofitting structures and getting them elevated. Uh, and now you need to because of this event. Um, so, and with the flood insurance changes that you all have started to hear about. So anyhow, uh, hazard mitigation is taking action to reduce or eliminate long-term risks from hazards and their effects. That is the definition that FEMA uses and our federal government uses. So here's, the, here's kind of where it all started. 1900, uh, the great hurricane in Galveston, 10,000 people lost their lives, uh, thousands of structures destroyed, wooden structures, uh, had very little satellite prediction and weather prediction. Um, 100 structures survived. Uh, they, they put up a bulkhead all the way around the front of the island. They basically dredged out of the bay and filled the island five feet higher and set the buildings back down on a, on a new foundation five feet higher than they used to be. Uh, that worked pretty good up until um, Ike in 09 uh, and overtopped the seawall a bit and then snuck around the back of the bay and took out a whole bunch of slab houses that they built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s thinking that the seawall was going to protect them, but it came in the back of them, four or five feet of water in all their slab homes. So uh, Galveston Island is now in an elevation process uh, three years, four years after the disaster. This is a obviously a southern style architecture. Uh, this would have been probably New Orleans or the Gulf Coast area. Um, uh, very primitive methods of elevation in those days. Basically individual jacks run by individuals, uh, probably railroad jacks, uh, mechanical jacks as opposed to hydraulic little bottle jacks that we have now. Uh, they would all get together and somebody would go, go, and they'd all click one click and the house would kind of go up like this. Uh, the cribbing is all different sizes and shapes. Um, you'll see as we go through this that a lot has changed since those early days of, of elevating structures. Uh, here we go through the weather change stuff briefly. In 2007, they thought it would be about a, a 0.2 to 0.4 meter level rise by 2100. 
The graph now shows what the estimates are as of 2011 is uh, 1.2 to 1.5 meters uh, sea level rise from where it is now uh, by 2100. So a lot of us will be gone, but our children and their children will be here. We have to up armor, we have to build tougher and smarter. And, um, and uh, uh, this is Owego, village of Owego up in upstate New York. And uh, after Lee, took 12 and a half inches of rain in 24 hour period. 80% um, of the town went underwater, 1200 structures. Never had seen anything like this. It was a real dirty river water, silty, nasty, stinky, and um, and uh, the name Owego and Iroquois, uh, we burned out their village after the Revolutionary War to, to create our white society here. The word Owego means where the river floods, so maybe we should have learned some Iroquois before we built there. It was a big, huge mercantile. Steamboats went all the way up uh, Pittsburgh up there to take care of lumbering and stuff. Beautiful town, all National Register listed buildings, kind of a town lost in time. Uh, and, and they're dealing with some elevations, 100 elevations have signed up out of their uh, community, and they hope to go forward this spring with some elevation work. This is your event, the Superstorm. They all look very similar from outer space, and the devastation is usually pretty similar. Uh, remember in Katrina, we took a 28-foot storm surge in Gulfport, Mississippi, and uh, 95,000 homes were lost there. So you've got about 300-some thousand homes flooded here, and, uh, and have lost quite a few, but there's a lot left surviving and a lot that can be mitigated and elevated and reused. So hazard mitigation, here's the kind of the materials and accessory tools that we use in the process. This is the wood cribbing uh, or wood blocks. Um, young people like to recall them and refer to them as jingle blocks, like the game. Uh, we use these to support the structure once it's elevated, to provide platforms for the jacks uh, to then elevate, and you'll see several pictures of different uses. They're made of pine or oak. We use the oak on heavy, heavy structures. We use pine on all the other structures. So the beach cottage would all use pine. Uh, the big two-story, uh, large, large, four or 5,000 square foot home in Rumson, uh, several of them are being estimated right now for elevation. Uh, we'll use oak cribbing on, on those as an industry. Steel beams, the bread and butter of our, what we do is the steel beam. Uh, we have them in different lengths. Uh, they are very thick, one-inch flanged I-beams, have very little deflection in them, uh, very strong and stout, and we use them for many, many years. These are uh, well-used steel beams. And uh, this was a home at Ocean Port that just went up as of, I think it was last Friday. Uh, this is the ubiquitous uh, track machine. Uh, has a bucket attachment, a fork attachment, um, a hammer jack attachment to uh, get through concrete. Um, it runs around your yard, delivering blocks to different parts of the project. Um, our process does tear up your yard. So when the process starts, you want to have salvaged the plants. A lot of people have really nice landscaping. You want to have your landscaper in there, pull the plants, pot them, and have them off to the side. Pull your pavers, stockpile them on some pallets over the edge of the yard, and let us get in and do our stuff, and regrade the yard, resod it, or reseed it uh, after the project is complete. Accessory equipment. This is the 15 ton jack. Uh, they come in a couple of different lengths. This is a three foot jack. Has a maximum stroke of 18 inches. You can only stroke the jack half of the, the length of it for safety measure. Um, those little notched collars are where they fit in a stand, so you can actually adjust the jack up closer to the steel and for the height you've got underneath the jack. Uh, so they're very uh, multi-adjustable. And then the head actually screws on a real coarse thread, so you can actually fine adjust it right up to the steel that it's gonna be lifting. Here's the jack in one of its bases. We use the little dog ear, things like you do on a big ship when they dog ear down the hatches in the storm. Um, those dog ears go into the grooves on the jack, so you can adjust the height of the jack. This jack is actually being recompressed after a lift. Uh, it's a gentleman's boot on there, and he's just pressuring the fluid back into the, the reservoir for the jacking machine, which you'll see in a little bit. This is one of our really neat developments over the last 15 years. It's called the New Zealand Toe Jack. Uh, developed in New Zealand, it um, has a multiple number of uses 
compared to that hydraulic jack that has been the mainstay for 40 years, 50 years, uh, it has a very low profile. So the, it, it has a the jack, the ram is inside a square tube, and then there's a little steel plate. So the actual jack sits this far above the ground, the plate. So you can actually, on these low profile buildings like the beach cottage, uh, where the, the building sits really close to the ground, you can actually pop out the CMU block, the concrete block, slide this thing under the bottom plate of the wall structure, the bottom wood member of the wall structure, put three of them on either side, pop up she goes. So it's a very, very useful tool in our, in our um, field. And basically it goes up about five, six feet in the air. And right there, they're depressurizing and running the fluid back into the reservoir after a lift. Here's two of the toe jacks set up on a chimney. Uh, remember, this industry is the industry that moved the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Uh, 2,900 feet from the ocean in the early 90s, um, 5,000 ton solid masonry structure. It's also the industry that moved the original historic Newark Airport Terminal back in the mid to late 90s, a 6,000 ton structure. So weight is not really an issue for us, and this is a lot easier to do than moving a structure. So we're just taking it off of its foundation and then lowering it onto a new foundation is all we're doing with this mitigation process. So you have steel beams, we cut some holes on the corners of the fireplace, run steel beams in to intersect with the other frame that's under the house, put some wood cribbing on top of that steel beam to provide a cushion against the stone, initiate the jacks with the rest of the lifting of the house, boom, it pops off of its concrete block foundation and up it goes with the house. So you can retain your fireplace in the new elevation. So here's the heart and soul of, of what we use to get these up. This was the 1950s. This was the first unified hydraulic jacking machines. That's what we call them. That's what you want to look for when you're hiring a contractor. Um, these were in the 50s when we were developing the interstate highway system. Thousands of homes had to be moved fairly rapidly out of the way of these interstates. And so some of the house movers got together with some hydraulics people in Chicago. They're still made in Chicago. The best of the machines are made there by a family, still making them second generation. The RAM in the hydraulic machine is patented. It takes six months and $100,000 to get the machine. This is the machine that we're using today is a descendant of those original machines that takes us six months to order. So the machines that are out there right now are the ones that are going to be helping you. So I know that there's some interest in ordering some additional machines, but um, uh, we're really kind of, the industry's waiting to see how many of these elevations really start going forward. And then there's those grants that come uh, six months, 18 to 24 months, to get people elevated who've already rebuilt uh, up in the air. Remember, we're just finishing our elevation grants in the Gulf Coast of Louisiana from Katrina Rita. So, um, 05 to 06. Well, actually, all 05. Rita came 30 days after Katrina, same spot. Uh, we were still underwater in New Orleans when we had to go back. Okay, here, let's go through the steps of how we actually get these structures up. First, we access some holes in evenly spaced intervals in your foundation. The house continues to rest on its original foundation. We just need some access so that we can put the steel beams under. This is a system that's used by one of the movers. This is a Rumson house that went up two weeks ago. Um, it's called a box beam. So by utilizing 12 inch beams, um, you actually can put the cross beams under the house and then you put this box beam on the outside and instead the beam slips through the beam instead of having to go underneath. So instead of being two feet of clearance needed, you only have to have that one foot of clearance, bolt the beams together and clamp them together and, and the whole framework goes up. Essentially we're putting a, a framework of steel under your structure and lifting it on that cradle of steel. Way over designed for any structure that we need to do. Uh, this is another look at it as, as it's actually being elevated, how the box beam carries all the cross beams, and then there's another strengthening beam out front that's clamped to it so they don't so they don't wander. It, it just stiffens the whole structure. Now we're going to talk about um, uh, kind of the issues that we deal with with sunrooms and uh, garages. Garages are usually on a slab. Uh, almost all are on a slab, um, and this is a sunroom, so it doesn't have the, str 
strengthen the walls because of the sliding glass door and stuff like that to lift with a steel frame under the floor. So what we do is we interweave the steel frame, we bolt two by 12s to the two by sixes or two by four wall load bearing members, we bolt them horizontally across, slip the steel underneath those two by 12s and then lift the load bearing walls with the steel underneath. And this steel here is connected to the steel that's under the rest of the house. So it all goes up at once. Now we'll look at a garage application. This is also, a, this is what we call a separation, a slab separation to get, get the lingo in your, in your brains for the vocabulary. There won't be a test. <laughs> this is um, basically, it's an interwoven uh, steel beam system through the rest of the house. It extends out into the garage, and then they rig up to lift the 2 by 12s This is an uh, exterior beam. Uh, this house had a U-shape in it, so there was this big area, entryway area, and so we had to span that with a beam, but once we span that at the foundation level, you can see some of the environments we work in. Uh, now it's all solid, but for a couple of weeks there, it was nothing but muck and mire and coal. The boys came home pretty muddy every night uh, from these kinds of jobs. Uh, we slipped that toe jack where we only have this much clearance between that wood cribbing and the steel beam. We slip the toe jack under there, initiate the lift with all the other jacks in the house. This is a toe jack in a minimum crawl space, but we didn't have a whole lot of crawl space. Once we got the beam in there, we couldn't put a jack underneath it, so we put the toe jack under the steel beam inside the house, and up it goes with the rest of the house. This is a jack in the middle of a stroke, as we call it. It's, it's stroked up now. Uh, we only go six to eight inches on each of the lifts. We have to do a series of lifts to get it to its elevation because you don't want to go 18 inches up. Uh, there's just too much that can happen. You go up six inches, put in a new layer of wood cribbing on a tower, then you go another six, put a wood cribbing in there if the jack was to fail. Uh, we've got the support right underneath the steel beam automatically at the end of every lift of six inches. It takes about a day to get to five, six feet if we start in the morning. Here's the toe jack doing the garage assembly. See how the steel beams are chained and, and put together with some wood block shims and up it goes with that frame connected to the frame under the house. And here we are. We're at four plus feet. It's high enough to build, the, demo out some of the old foundation, add the new foundation. It's in an A zone, so it gets to keep its original footing. It's not a two-story house, so it didn't have to have additional engineering, a new foundation. Uh, they just basically run some new courses of block. They leave pockets for where our steel beams are. When we lower it, they're called beam pockets. We pull the steel out, the masons come back, plug those holes. It's a solid, brand new foundation. It can be painted, it can be added stone, brick, facing, stucco, things like that. There's another one in uh, Rumson, right on the bay, um, you know, in a wetland, and that's the finished elevation. I think it's about five feet. Uh, that's going to get a whole new foundation, and it's going to be in the V zone, so it's going to have an open leg foundation uh, required for the pass through of water in a velocity zone. That's what the V zone means. This is in Rumson. They were in the middle of a remodel addition and uh, took the event, and so the entire structure now goes up to the new height, a new foundation. Uh, I believe that one's getting a new foundation. This one, they're just adding to the foundation. This was another Rumson house, um, and, and basically they're just adding, using the same original footing, and just adding courses of CMU blocks that's far enough away from the water to where it can have a solid foundation. The rule of thumb is, in the A zone, you can have solid concrete blocks to six feet, and then you have to go open legs, because more than six feet is just not structurally as sound uh, on a solid, on a concrete block wall. And you have to have the flood vents near to the ground to allow water to come in and retreat from the structure. Those are all engineered design. Uh, in the V zone, uh, you primarily have to go down to the open leg foundation with concrete block, backfill with mortar and rebar into a piling system and a footing. Now, I'm not the engineer. Engineers or architects have to be engaged with the plan drawings because you can't get a permit to do this work until you have a, a stamped set of drawings from an engineer or an architect um, to, to proceed into permitting and construction. 
sir? Yes. Do you want to accept questions now? Or you uh, at the end. I'm sorry. We'll do the questions at the end. If you can make notes and, sure. and then and then uh, get to those questions. And I'm going to try and drag the mayor back in because I really want to stay on the elevation side. He's got other additional information for you all as, as uh, regards to grants and some announcements by the governor tomorrow. So, uh, and then here's back to that U-shaped, kind of unique shaped house uh, up in the air ready for the foundation work. And you can see that it was very rainy and the yard's pretty well shorn up and they'll just grade it back out and reseed it uh, when we're done cleaning up. So I'm gonna give you some tips now for selecting a contractor from this industry. We do have some that are coming up out of the Gulf, have excess machinery down there, highly skilled, highly trained and experienced. You can Google or Yahoo, home elevation companies licensed in New Jersey or home elevation companies in New Jersey. They've all put keywords in their websites to where it pops up and they get on the list. And, and definitely ask for two or three estimates. Uh, they have, some have a per square foot pricing arrangement, some do how many days are we on the job with a crew type estimating. So there are variables in the estimates. There are variables in when they can get to you also. So uh, those are, uh, but we do have about six companies now, I'm hoping that a couple more come. I've been in touch with a few, a couple others. Um, and I think we'll be here five to 10 years. Yeah, all of them have to be licensed to perform the work in New Jersey. And insured, and, and I'm gonna, and here's the tips. Proof of contractor license in the state of New Jersey, you have to have a home improvement contractor's license. We're hoping to increase that qualification uh, due to the fact that well, there's so much demand that uh, in the Gulf when we had this much demand, uh, people with no previous experience were able to get hold of a machine, uh, go into the business, we had some adverse incidents happen with some houses. Uh, you really want people with experience doing this. We don't have enough experienced contractors to do that. We have talked with uh, the township and Brick about a community college program, maybe the industry could start to actually train these machine operators uh, because you're gonna need probably twice as many contractors as you, as you have available now ultimately over the next five or six years. We'd like to help create more of this industry up here. We can't do it all, the guys that are here in a timely manner. We really need more industry here. So we're very willing to bring some experts to the community college that are already working these machines. We need crew, additional crew members, so if we can train people in a college setting, we can get them into our industry and start working them on another machine every day. Um, proof of cargo, uh, liability insurance, a million really isn't enough. You wanna try and pick a contractor with three million in liability insurance, especially for the larger projects. Uh, you can ask you can, that I've been in touch with that are helping sponsor this series of education stuff have a list of references uh, that you can contact. Many of them are going to be in the Gulf, but because um, we just haven't done a whole lot here yet. But we're hoping to add to that reference just very quickly up here. Um, at, uh, ask the contractor if there's ever been a litigation that they had a judgment against them. Any good contractor, no matter who they are, carpenter, painter, electrician, plumber, house elevator, works with the customer if there's an issue and fixes that issue. If it goes to litigation, they're litigated against, that relationship broke down somewhere. You need to know that before contracting with these individual companies. So that's basically in a nutshell. We as an industry are here to help you build back stronger, smarter, and safer. Um, and, and that's what our commitment is. I fully intend to be, I'll tell you a brief story. Uh, 13 years of age, living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mother thought I was too much of a handful. I'm still kind of a handful, I got energy. Um, uh, my uncle was stationed at McGuire Air Force Base. She sent me out here to be with the Colonel for a, a summer, you know, I'm gonna learn some discipline. He put me on a boat in the yacht club at Tom's River, and I spent many a weekend over at Seaside Heights, and there was some kissing discoveries underneath the boardwalk, and I had a great time here, and I'm really excited to be back, to give back, um, uh, for all those great memories that I have. So uh, I'm really looking forward to my first summer in Jersey. <laughs> so anyhow, that's it for the main presentation. I can field questions about the process, selecting a contractor, but other things like grants and uh, elevation heights and mapping and stuff, we're hoping to get the mayor back in here. And actually, could someone in the back let him know that we're at that point? Because we kind of tag team on these questions and answers.
I'll start over on this side and then I'll bounce. Yes. I'm not living in it. Right. It's not happening. Understand where exactly. And where so you're what do I do first? And where do I just, I'm gonna let the mayor answer that question. Where do I just question. walk away and give up? No, never give up. You fight. Here we go. Uh, that that is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Uh, what I what I have told most people, and this is what I'm doing. Uh, some people know this, some people don't. My son bought the house across the lagoon from me a week before the storm. He closed on that house. He is now in a V zone. I am in an A zone. I am rebuilding my house. I'm going to move it back in into it because I can raise my house and put it back down on a foundation. That's pretty much an easy decision. If you're in a V zone which I assume you're in a visa. That is the, there's a couple things. Number one, the governor is going to be making a major announcement tomorrow on elevations. He's going to be making that announcement, I believe, in Seaside. Uh, you have a couple more decisions to make. The first one is, when they came out with these V zones, are you on open water, meaning a bay, a creek, or, or something open, or are you on a lagoon? Lagoon. Lagoon, okay. I, I believe, and I'll tell you why it's true, they've overstepped their bounds when it came to V zones on lagoons. When they came out with these maps, they basically said that if you were the 12th house in the lagoon and you were in a V, they assumed that those other 11 houses out to the open water weren't there and that wave would roll all the way in and hit your house. The working maps that are going to be coming out in, and I just found this out last week, the working maps that are going to be coming out in the spring are going to include those houses. Meaning that if a wave hits that first house, it's pretty much going to be knocked down. It may hit the second, but then it's not going to hit the rest. I am hoping that a lot of the people that are in B zones up inside lagoons are going to go back to A zones, like my son across the lagoon. That is what we're asking for. That is what we've talked to the map people about. And you know, we the other thing is is that we didn't I didn't just send we didn't just send a letter, you know, to the map people saying, well, we think it's unfair and we want you to do this. We actually used GIS data. And what that data said was is that they didn't, you know, they told us they didn't use Sandy as a way to draw these maps. Well, we basically did an overlay and we showed them how they did. So they're using a 200 year storm to give us a 100 year flood elevation map. That is unfair. Um, we sent that out there. They said, we're gonna send it to our map people and have an answer. So your, your decision and what I told my son is, he got in his house, he's living in a rental. I told him to live there until the preliminary maps come out in the spring. There's working maps. Because those working maps are going to include that WAFIS wave action, whatever the rest of it is, data. So that's what I'm telling them to do. If some people say, you know what, I have the money, I don't have to worry about grants, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff, I'm going to knock my house down, I'm going to build it on pilings, I don't care if I'm an A or a V, you know, it doesn't matter. And that may be true for some people because everybody knows that the uh, federal flood subsidies are going away. There was an act that was uh, passed this past summer, very quietly, it was attached to a transportation bill. It failed Congress several times, passed when it was attached to this bill. I think it's called the Bigger's Waters Act, something along those lines. I call it the Big Waters Act. Uh, it does away with federal subsidies on flood insurance. So if you are below the BFE, the base flood elevation, and let's say you own your house, and you say, Steve, I am not raising my house. I own my house, I don't have to worry about it. Well, you can't get flood insurance because if you do, if you're below the BFE, it'll cost you, I don't know, 15, 18, 20 thousand dollars. I'm paying 1600 right now. If I stay below the BFE, my flood insurance will probably go to 10 or 15 thousand dollars. I can't afford to live in my house. So I need to raise my house. For every foot above the base flood elevation you get, that's a discount off your flood insurance, up to four feet above. So I have to raise my house three and a half feet. I'm raising it a full, whatever it is, 10 or 12. I'm gonna park my cars under my house, but I'm in an A zone. V zone people, Rod said, if we can do helical piles, we have any engineers in the room? If we do, okay. We, we would love to know whether we can do helicals with sauna tubes and rebar, because that means that we can raise our houses and put them back down on those pilings. If you wanna raise a house and move it, Onto the street? You can't. We have no room. You can't put it on a lagoon. So the choice is, if you put money into your house and you move back into it, let's say you spent 30, 40 grand, 
and then you find out that you have to knock it down a year from now or two years from now when the maps don't change, you've wasted that money. As, a, as an architect and an engineer told me when we had a regional meeting with our architects and engineers, if your house is not worth $150,000 and you're in a V zone, chances are it's probably not worth it for you to, to raise it. Uh, I don't know whether Rod mentioned it or not. Uh, and the reason, you know, Rod came in and talked to me about this seminar. I thought it was very important for people to actually see, especially my wife, how you raise a house. Because it's like, how do you raise the house? Down in Louisiana, they actually had several houses that fell and several people that got killed. I think there were six people that actually died raising homes. So my thing was is that we wanted to have this seminar to show people how it's done and to make sure it's done safely. Because from Brick Township's perspective, we may be in this, not in the business, but what I'm being told from FEMA is some of this money that comes, flows from the federal government to the New Jersey State Office of Emergency Management, to the counties and the municipalities, we are going to be doing the raising, not the town, so to speak. But we're going to contract. If there's 10 houses in a neighborhood that are going to get raised, we actually contract with one company to do it. And they're going to raise those, those houses. And it's going to be paid for with either community development block grant money or hazard mitigation money. CDBG money, I'm being told, is going to start to flow into our area in the next six to nine months. Hopefully the governor says something about that tomorrow. Hazard mitigation grant money does not start to flow for 18 months to 24 months. I was outside answering a bunch of questions. I'm, I'm unsure whether Rod covered that or not. So the, I can't answer that question. A lot of people say, well, what would you do? I can only tell you what I'm telling my son to do. Stay in your house for another three months, you know, in your rental. Um, and then hopefully when these working maps come out, you'll have, if you're in a V, when the working maps come out, you'll probably stay in a V. Big community development block grants, CDBG money, community development block grant money, and everybody will learn these acronyms just like we learned, you know, ABFEs, advisory based flood elevation. Um, that money comes from the federal government to the New Jersey State Office of Emergency Management, then either to the county and to the town, or from the state OEM directly to the town. That is federal money, but that is different from your increased cost of compliance money, that $30,000 you have if you have flood insurance. Also, this CDBG money is for primary homes only. That's what we're being told in the beginning. If it's a secondary home, you will have the availability for hazard mitigation money. That's what I'm being told. But the CDBG money, primary homes uh, originally first. Yes? They've got something working on the rebuild now, get in on a temporary permit of occupation. Yeah. So here's one of the things is, is that if you are in a, uh, an, a V zone or even an A zone, you know, you have to raise your house. Uh, FEMA gives us points on hazard mitigation money on the houses that get raised. So the town is not like going to let you, you know, say, okay, uh, I'm going to move back in my house and I'm not going to ever raise it. Well, the problem with that is if you are substantially damaged, you're going to get a temporary certificate of occupancy with the understanding that you're going to attempt to raise your home in the future. And I always like to say this, I bought a ranch for a reason, probably like Larry. I, bought, I don't want to walk upstairs. Well, now I'm going to be a floor up, so I'm going to have to get one of those things that goes on the stair. To raise, I can sit on it. It's going to raise me up. I didn't want to live on a, on a, on a second floor. Uh, but the town will give you a TCO with the understanding you're going to raise your house. If you don't raise your house, you know, if you don't raise it, at some point, the town, hopefully long after I'm here, the town is going to say, listen, Mrs. Smith, Mr. Smith, you didn't raise your home. You haven't even applied to raise your home. You have a year to raise your home, and then we're going to pull that certificate of occupancy, and you're, you're not going to be able to live there. Because the town's got to give you a CO to live in the house. So you have to be able to live, well, you know what, I can tell you this, the town is going to do that at some point because FEMA requires it. And you say, well, I live in my house, I don't, I'm not going to get flood insurance. Like I said before, I didn't say it already, that's great. You don't need flood insurance, but if anybody wants to buy your house, they can't get a mortgage. Because if you can't get a mortgage, the bank's not going to loan you money unless you can buy the house. If you're below the BFE, your flood insurance might be 20000 a year. I'm above the BFE. 
My flood insurance is 2000 a year. Who do you think they want to buy it? What house do you think the person's going to want to buy? They don't want to pay a mortgage and flood insurance and taxes. They want to pay the lowest amount that they can. Yes, sir. Man, I, I find this is, this is turning into a disaster. Because well, we had a disaster. That was sad to believe me. When our property disaster. values are going to be high. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Property, let me talk a little bit about property values. We all on the water, and I'm one of them, and, and most people know this. I always wanted to live on my boat. I just never thought I'd live on my boat behind my house in the winter because my house is trashed. And when my pipes froze the morning this morning and I tried to take a shower, there was no water coming out. It wasn't very fun. It is a disaster. But what we're trying to do is what every other town, municipality, city has done over the last hundred years, which is when something like this happens, make it as easy as people to rebuild as possible. For example, if you have to raise your house five feet and you're already at 38 feet, the council has assured me that they're just going to take that five feet and put it on top of the 38. If you've got to go up seven, you'll put it right on top. No board of adjustment, no zoning or anything like that. If you need to put stairs in front of your home, you've got a front yard setback. Those stairs are going to encroach into that front yard setback. We're already going to change that to allow you to do that. Putting uh, your air conditioning up on the side of your house, side yard setbacks. All of that stuff is going to be addressed. This is our first rodeo. I've never done this before, neither of all of us. But I can tell you that people down there have done it. People in Florida have done it. We talked, we had a company in the other day from Florida in Dade County that wrote the Florida uh, Hazard Mitigation Protocol. We're going to get them to come up and tell us how they did it. So yeah, property values, all of our property values, they're down, probably 20, 30%. If you didn't fill out that material depreciation form, you're gonna be able to appeal your taxes next year. I am already looking into whether we're going to do a mass revaluation for us on the water, or whether it will be done on a case-by-case -case basis or a neighborhood basis. Because as Steve could tell you, you know, neighborhoods can come in, associations can come in, and appeal their taxes and do it on a, on a on neighborhood basis. It's easier, cheaper for the people that live there. The attorneys make a lot of money, but you know, that's okay. Uh, I only want people to pay taxes on what their house is valued on. And that's the way it is. That's not set by the town. Everybody wants to yell and scream about it, but it's set through the county board of taxation and then the state. The state was the one that said, normally, I think it's uh, October 31st, you have to put your form in for so if you had a fire, you could say, I don't want to pay my taxes because my house is caught on fire. The governor extended that until January 10th. So they're aware of it. We're aware of it. We understand. And that's why I love when people go, ah, you know what? I wasn't affected by Sandy. I have nothing to worry about. Well, I can tell you, if you live in Lake Riviera, Herbertsville, any of those other areas, taxes are going to change. Just so that you know, we have $9 million in the bank right now because we had the referendum. We're down right now about eight million. This year may not be bad. Next year, you know, first of all, your taxes are going down. My taxes, I expect to go down. Because my house isn't worth what it was, uh, uh, you know, two years ago, five years ago. I expect that to happen. Other places on the mainland, it's going to be interesting to see how, how those, what those, there's going to be a transitional, a transitioning of the rateable base from one area, waterfront homes, to people that don't live on the water. That's going to be the interesting part. And then the other thing is, is home values. You know, you live in an area that was hit by oh, a superstorm. They don't like to call it a hurricane. A superstorm. So all of those things are going to come into play. Brick Township, seven, ten years from now, six years from now, will be better, stronger, healthier financially. Because those houses will be raised, they'll be rebuilt, and people will be paying taxes. What are we going to do in the next four years? It's going to be a tough road to hoe. And anybody that says, oh, no problem, government's going to come in, going to give you all the money, take it, it's not that way. But everybody in every other part of the country, it worked and, and it got better. Galveston, Texas, four years ago, that storm hit down here, 16% of their population left. 16%. They're still raising houses four years later. This is a long term process. Nothing's going to happen immediately. Young lady in the back. Couple questions. Give me one at a time because I won't be able to remember. No, no. And I'll, I'll, I will repeat the question for anybody that can't hear. The, the grant, is that available to those that did not have flood or just had flood? 
Community development block grant money will be, my understanding is from the DCA commissioner, it will be available for repairing and lifting homes. So whether you are substantially damaged or not, you're, if you are below the BFE, your home at some point, if you want it to be affordable for flood insurance, is going to have to be raised. Because I don't know of too many people that can go from paying $1,600 a year in flood insurance to seven or 8000 Again, My understanding is, from talking to people in the governor's office, uh, they are going to put a lot of money into Brick Township to rebuild and, and to raise homes and to do a lot of those things. One last thing I'll say real quick. Um, in areas that flood a lot, we always love to go when people say, raise the roads. Well, if we raise the road a foot, it would flood out everybody in those homes. But I can tell you this, that once those houses are raised in that neighborhood, we're already talking about going in and re-engineering that road and raising it so that, you know, because we don't have to worry about flooding out the home. That is the next step of this process. So it's not like you're living in Venice. I think the question was, if I heard it correctly, can we go and, and do some of the work and then apply for the grants and re get reimbursed? What I am being told right now, and Rod said that that did happen in some other areas, what I'm being told that that is a no, that if you rebuild your house on your own, they're going to say, well, you, know, you don't need the money, because obviously you had the money someplace, you borrowed it, whatever it was, if you don't need it, somebody else that does need it is going to get it first. I am hoping that they change that. Uh, and they have changed it in other disasters. So whatever they've done in other disasters to help people, I would assume that our that the governor, uh, who, who the FEMA people tell me has done more and has pushed things faster than a lot of other states, because anybody knows him. He's like a bow in a china shop. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. I am hoping that that will be, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't guarantee it today and say, yeah, I'm going to raise my house, I'm going to spend 80000 to raise it, and I'm just going to wait for that grant money to reimburse. Uh, that's not the case, I don't believe, right away. And uh, this, there was somebody who wanted to... You know, getting an SBA loan, in my, first of all, if you haven't applied for an SBA loan, apply for it. Because that gives us points in the hazard mitigation grant scenario. So if we had 10,000 homes that were damaged, and all 10,000 people applied for SBA loans. Not everybody's going to get it, maybe half, maybe a third, whatever it is. But that helps us because then they say, oh, look, a lot of people applied for that loan. If you get that loan, you don't have to use it. You don't have to use it for a year. You can actually then apply for an extension of another six months to see if you get uh, uh, CDBG money of 40,000, you get your ICC of 30, and then you're, you need another 10,000, that's when the SBA loan or 20,000 might come in that you might be able to use it. Uh, and follow up? Yeah, yeah it, first of all, if you don't have flood insurance, you should be applying to the, uh, the uh, Robin Hood, you know, that Robin Hood 12, 12, 12 concert. They, had a, they raised about, I don't know, $80 million. They've given out about 20 million already. Uh, not to Brick, I mean, not to New Jersey. Only about six million came to New Jersey. But I believe Visitation Church, uh, they're gonna go through other organizations. They're not gonna give it directly to homeowners. In addition to that, the, uh, uh, the First Lady's uh, Sandy Relief Fund, that a lot of people raised money for, they are going to have their application for uh, groups. That's gonna be online shortly. They're not going to accept applications for individual homeowners because they don't want to do the management, no, and they don't want to do the research. They feel, this is what they told me, and I was on the phone with the executive director on Friday. Uh, what she told me was is they would rather deal with an organization, Catholic Charities, Habitat for Humanity, or whatever it is, those groups who vet the people out that didn't have flood insurance, uh, you know, falling through the cracks, a veteran, somebody that didn't, didn't have any help. They got 30,000 from FEMA and that was it uh, because they didn't have flood insurance. So I would apply to any and all of those things. Let me get this side then I'll go back and forth. Oh. Yes, because you're talking about raising the house, $15 a square foot, plus again the pipes and the electrical and the foundation or the pilings. You start adding all of that back in. It doesn't take you long before you get to 60, 70, $80,000 to raise a home. That is one of those decisions where you talk about, you know, if you renovate a home, about 170, 180 dollars a square foot we're getting from some people. If you build a home, you know, from scratch, 
builders grade 125. I, I, mean, I don't know. I'm just you know. But those are those are issues that are difficult. Those hypotheticals for us, for me to answer. People always say, "Well, Steve, what would you do?" I can only tell you what I'm doing and what I told my son to do. What you do as a as a resident, that's a whole bunch of stuff that you need to square away. Yes, Steve. The ICC money we talked about. I know we talked about raising the houses. What about The Township Council passed last night, uh, we requested that they pass a private property disposal program. Disposal, it's a PPRD or removal. What it is is this. Uh, we will, you will be able to contract kind of through the town. You'll have to fill out a form and, and we'll make that known to everybody. If you have not given us your email address, call the Township, get on that email list. Or if you're not a face, if you do Facebook, uh, get on the Facebook, we'll post that as well. What happens is this, there's right now a 75-25 split. So if you say I want to knock my house down, it's $10,000. You can sign a form that says we will go onto your property, we'll look at it, say yes, you're going to knock it down, it's, it's going to be knocked down. Um, FEMA will come out, they'll certify it, they'll look at it, they'll take pictures of it, they will approve you, they'll do that through several houses in a neighborhood that want to be knocked down, the town will then come in here and contract with a company to knock down those houses. You will be responsible for 25% of the cost. So if it's $10,000 to knock the house down, you would be responsible for $2,500. However, that $2,500 can be used, that ICC money can be used to fund that $2,500. Now I know the governor is pushing for a 90-10 reimbursement, you know, 90% feds, only 10% us. Um, I don't know whether that's going to happen, but I was told that that is going to happen. But we've got to go with 75-25 now. Now that's to knock it down. What about to put it up on filing? Can you apply? You can do whatever, whatever that other money is, you can apply down to that. And that is like a construction loan. A lot of people think that if you get 80 grand to fix up your house, they're going to send you the check for 80,000. You put it in the bank and you go to Atlantic City, you put it on red. Uh -uh. They make it out to you and your mortgage company if you have a mortgage. It's then sent to them and it's a drawdown. They'll send you a lot of times 20% up front and then they'll say when 35% of the work is done, call us. The company will then come out and send an inspector out to look at your home to make sure the work is being done. They will then release the money and that check will be made out to you and your contractor. If you're doing the work yourself, I don't know what they do. Uh, I, you, you got me there. I'm not sure what they do. But that, yes, you can use it to raise it. You can use all of it. You can use the ICC money combined with community development block grant money to raise it. So if you're in an A and you can afford to wait, then that's what that's what I am doing. I am not, I won't even look to raise my house for a year or two because it, it, I need to take time for some of this other stuff to shake out. And go, honestly, I can, hey, who's gonna, who can afford that? Yes. First of all, if you're not substantially damaged, uh, and you're going to just go in there and do some minor stuff. A lot of times you don't even need a building permit if you're replacing some things. You just move back into your home. But if you don't raise your house above the BFE, your flood insurance is going to go through the roof. So at some point you're going to look to do that. Who wants to pay $15,000 a year for flood insurance for 10 years? That's $150,000. When you maybe only could have paid up, you know, uh, $50,000, that's $100,000 you could have used to raise your house. But if you have substantially, you are substantially damaged. You will only get a temporary CO on the house and maybe an at-risk building permit. You have to sign something that says, I'm going to raise it in the future at some point. And then you get in the queue to raise your house at some point in the future. A gentleman did bring up a good point, and I thought about it, and I asked this question the other day. If I don't raise my house right away, and I'm, let's say I'm four years down the road, and then I'm going to raise my house, those two years, because two years from now, you know the new flood information a flood insurance rate maps come into play and flood insurance will start to go up. So if I don't raise my house for four years, I'm going to have two years of higher flood insurance. I'm not sure, sure I'm going to be able to afford that depending on what it is. You know, it can go up 20% a year until it gets to 100, but nobody knows. I, I can't tell you what that number is going to be. You know, again, they want it to be a self-sufficient program. I'm not so sure that Congress, after people all over the country, what do they say? 80% of the people in this country live within 10 miles of the shoreline. When people in Florida, and Delaware, and North Carolina, and these other places 
get wind of this act that was passed silently. Nobody knew about it. Anybody hear about it on the news? I didn't. But it's going to affect millions and millions and millions of people. I'm not so sure that a lot of people are not going to be calling their congressmen saying, what do you mean my flood insurance is going from $2,000 to $8,000? I can't afford to live here. You need to change this. I would hope that at some point that may change, but I can't plan on that. It's hypothetical. Yes, sir. So the, the question is, when are you going to apply for that? Yeah, as soon as as soon as soon the money, because it was just passed by Congress, they are going through the process of how they're going to allocate that money. And there are some percentages, meaning that when the town comes up with all of the money that they need to spend on infrastructure and different things like that, we throw everything in the pot plus the kitchen sink. Because what we give to them that is an equation of what then they're going to give to us for mitigation in the first year. Once Congress, or I should say the uh, well, Congress in general, figures out how they're going to allocate the money, and it comes to the state OEM, Office of Emergency Management, and they tell us how that's going to work, then we will make it known to everyone. Fill out the form. It's a request. We want to raise our home. Uh, we are going to announce, hopefully within the next week or so, that every neighborhood is going to have a hazard mitigation group, if you will. That's going to be made up of people in your neighborhood, maybe six or seven people. One of those people is going to belong to a town-wide hazard mitigation group. That hazard mitigation group is going to decide based on priorities of neighborhoods. I'm not going to decide it. It's going to be decided by people of what neighborhoods are raised first, why they're raised first, and it has to be a type of scoring reason. You know, meaning that Shore Acres gets flooded all the time, Normandy gets flooded all the time. And, and so you take those, and there is a formula that Dade County came up with that now is used throughout the state of Florida. We want to get that formula. We want to incorporate it here so that we can give people a, a fair way to do it. Because one of the things we're not going to do is say, oh, you know what? Um, so-and-so lives in this neighborhood, and this is the first neighborhood that's going to get raised. It's not going to happen. It has to be done in an objective way by the citizen's input, not necessarily the government. I took a question here, and I'll go there. Yes? The grants money, ICC grants, CB. Are there means tests attached to these grants? I believe there are not. There are no means. If you need to raise your home, then you're going to get your home, and, and you qualify, and the house is a raise. The only test they do is a benefit analysis, uh, a BC, BC, benefit cost analysis, BCA. I don't know what that BCA is yet. It includes the number of claims on your structure. It's, it's been repetitively flooded things. Um, the potential for future damage based on its past track record, the property value, and the cost of the project. The cost of the project cannot exceed cost of previous claims, the value of the structure, it's got to be a one or greater benefit. And most everybody fits into it uh, when, the, when the cost of the elevations, and if you've been previously flooded, uh, most everyone fits within that cost benefit. And let me tell you, um, in a disaster, you, you have good behaviors and you have bad behaviors, and humans go very quickly into those behaviors, they don't usually have much gray area. Uh, about how they're behaving. Our industry is committed to holding prices the way they are in all the other places in the country, even though you've got tremendous demand. We're not going to raise prices uh, because there's more work here than we can get done this year. We're not going to raise prices. We're charging the same here as we charge in the Gulf, as we charge in the, in the, in the Midwest. Um, our, our, our companies are dedicated to this state and its needs. And so I think that uh, the reputable ones, the ones that belong to the International Association of Structural Movers, you really want a, a person that's involved, uh, engaged in that national organization for structural movers and elevation companies. So. We, yeah, and, and see, one of the original things is I, the, I didn't want the government to get involved in raising houses. I think that individuals, if, if, if 
we get $50,000 for you to raise your home. I would rather give you the $50,000 than for government to administer it, do the tests and everything else, because if we do it, we've got to do prevailing wage. You can if you want or you don't have to. You can shop it around, we can't. It's got to be a certain type of process. And what I can tell you is, if it costs us, or if it costs you, 50000 to raise your house, it'll cost the government 150000 yeah. And the problem with that is, is that we only get a certain amount of money. So instead of being able to raise, you know, 50 houses in one year, we might only be able to raise 25. Or instead of, you know, 300, we can only raise 100. So I, I am going to push for that, the way it go to you, through us to you. But what I'm being told from the people in Florida and other places that no, it's going to have to be done by the town. So yes, we would come up with a list of places, a list of, of people to raise houses. You know, but again, like I, I said to people during uh, the storm when people were getting their electric turned back on, please don't depend on the government to tell you that your electric is okay in your house. I don't ever trust the government to tell me anything. All right, so I'm going to get my own licensed electrician. I'm going to do my own research when it comes to raising houses. And if the government gives me a, a list of 10 people to raise houses, I'm going to vet every single one of them, and then I'm going to try and pick the one that I think is the best. And, and that's what Rod said. Some people did that in other areas. Uh, we have, according to FEMA, more damaged homes than any other town in, that was uh, hit by the hurricane, uh, whether it's Camp Osborne, the mainland, uh, other on Barron Island. Uh, we have more. We used to say brick's got more, more, more water from property than any other town in the state. Now we go, brick has got more water from property than any other town. You know, it, it, but, but like I said to you, we will get there. The governor knows brick. He knows Ocean County. We are very, very important to him. And I am assured in every conference call on Friday with his office, and on uh, Friday when I picked up the phone and called the Department of Community Affairs uh, Rich Constable cell phone, and he answered it. And you know, we had a little thing back with, with the electric. And, and he, so they know that we, and we're told that a lot of money is gonna flow into Brick Township to raise houses and to repair houses. When, I'm hoping within the next six, month, six to nine months, um, it gives people a longer time period, absolutely, that's an issue. Uh, and so I wish I could tell you that it was gonna be next week or next month, but it's not. And I'm not going to tell you it is. Unless the governor says something tomorrow uh, that is going to say, hey, it's coming right away, uh, it's going to get here as soon as it can, as soon as they can get it through. But you know, Congress still hasn't even decided how much is coming to New Jersey. So how can we come up with a criteria to measure who's going to get what if they haven't even decided how much is coming? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Oh, sir. I have all right, as long as it's a good comment. Yeah. It's not like the old tax guy, and then he left. Okay. Uh, uh, the comment is, um, Wolf Movers um, have uh, at least paid houses for me, and they do such a good job. I'm not selling for them. Yep. They do such a good job. They moved uh, a couple of houses, a couple of miles, and they raised a uh, couple of houses for me, and it's, it's an honest company. Yep. And, uh, I've heard of them. They actually gave a couple prices to uh, some people in town. As a matter of fact, April, April Henkel. Uh, if anybody knows her, Vern, Vern was a gentleman that was in the, uh, in the, in the hole when the roof all fell on him. Uh, April was actually going to be getting her house raised, I think, by Wolf. They, they just hold the house like uh, two months ago. Like, like, How much was it? Do you remember? Yeah, it was $18,000 to the house, uh, only about a little more than a half a mile. Okay. So the pricing is good. Yeah, we're not trying to do yeah. sales here. No, right. no, 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 no. I know you don't represent them, but you're probably going to get a... Google, yeah. no, yeah. 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 You really want an internet some search. Of the yeah. I do a store account. Some of the structures are in store, so they have a lot of experience. Use whoever you want. Right. It's an honest company. It, 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 you know what? Wolf, Ducky Johnson, Next you know, all, 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 all of those people, we don't want to... Yeah, Myron, uh, you know, they all are, know each other. Yeah, the industry yeah. all knows we go to the conferences together. There's an Atlantic or a Northeast Structural Movers Association, in addition to the International Association of Structural Movers. Um, that's why you know that all the all the people who've done this for a long time are all talking. We're all going to have the same relative pricing and relative services provided. 
uh, just stick with the people who've been in the industry and we're going to try and train some people to add to that industry.